Book of Joel. That's back about the middle of your Bible. Find Isaiah, flip through Jeremiah, no Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, then you'll be at Joel. If you hit Amos, you've gone too far, turn back one. If you're still turning your papers now, then just stop. I'll read it. Just picking on y'all. So. If you're visiting with us, I'm crazy, but you'll get used to it. The book of Joel, chapter 1 and verse 1. We're going to read where God tells us the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, and all ye inhabitants of the land. Had this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust has left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from the mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. And he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray you have a, a meaningful touch on our lives as we take time out to read your word, to study your word, to preach your word. Lord, I pray you move in me, Lord, empty me this morning that you might fill me with your sweet spirit, Lord, Father. I pray you just start right here at this pulpit, Lord, and work your way through these pews, and down these aisles, Lord God, and touch hearts and lives, Lord, Father. If there be one lost, God, I pray you touch them. <coughs> Those that are burdened down, Lord, those that are tired, those that are needing a touch this morning, Lord Father, I pray you'd move in a mighty way, Lord God, in their lives. God, we just praise you and thank you for what you're going to do. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Yes. Joel, a prophet to the people of Judah. His name means Jehovah is God. His father's name was Pethuel, which means the wisdom of God. Many commentators believe that Joel is the first written prophet in the Bible that we have recorded for us. Many consider that he was a contemporary of the prophet Elijah. The first chapter of Joel deals with an invasion of locusts as we read there. It had destroyed the land. And it was also, if you read on in chapter 1, there's a severe drought that comes on Israel. And these events are being used by God to warn the people of a much more serious problem spiritually among the people. Uh, remember, prophets were not only tellers of things to come in the future, but they were great preachers in the day that they lived. In other words, they had a message not only for you and I, but uh, for the day that they lived in. Uh, they proclaimed the heavenly message. They uh, proclaimed God's judgment. His truth, His wrath on sin. In the book of Joel, in, in chapter 1, a calamity had come upon this nation. And as we read there uh, in verse 2, uh, Joel asked the elders, those that had been around a long time, some of you that are kind of long in the tooth, so to speak. And he asked them, he said, have you ever in your life seen anything like the day that we're living in? I believe we could ask that question and I can put forth that question to you this morning. Amen. Have we ever lived in a time that any of you can remember like the time that we're living in now? No. And I think Joel was there for a specific, a specific purpose and it was to sound the alarm. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, blow the trumpet. Sound the alarm. Take the shofar out and blow it and call a solemn assembly and get my people together. They need to wake up at last for the day of the Lord is at hand. You see, the day of the Lord is a future event in which God comes back and our Lord and Savior sets foot on the Mount of Olives. 
and the armies of the nations and the worlds gathered together. And he comes back in the battle of Armageddon and he puts down every foe and, and brings his wrath and judgment and sets up his millennial reign. And that's what the day of the Lord is. But there's also a day of the Lord right now. The Bible says this is the day that the Lord has made. And Joel's prophesying here for these people, for this time, and I believe there's some practical applications for you and I now. As we read along this, we find that this national calamity uh, had been uh, brewing for a long time. And I would submit to you uh, that God was allowing something to come on them in a physical way to point out and to parallel what had already took place spiritually in their lives. In other words, long before this locust plague came, long before it ate up all the goodness in the land, all the life that was in the land, long before they started mourning because of these locusts, they started mourning. The beasts were even mourning in the field. The farmer was mourning. We read there in verse uh, 4, I believe it was, and 5, it said, you drunkards are even mourning because of what's going on in the land of that. And long before they were mourning because of the locusts, there was something going on spiritually in their life. You see, uh, God uses these judgments at times to sound the alarm, to bring awareness to you and I about something that's going on inside of us. Something that's going on morally. Something that's going on spiritually. You see, God was allowing this plague of locusts and drought to devastate the people in order to wake them up from their spiritual devastation that had long been going on. Not only in their religious life, but their social life, their financial life. You name it. These people of God that we're talking about here had strayed from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Jehovah God. Now you notice in verse 4 uh, that there was a locust plague. Now you'll notice that there were four different insects in verse 4. Did you see that? The palm worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar. Now some believe that these are four different insects uh, and they came in droves. One came, did some destruction. The other one came and finished what that one left. Then the other came and finished what was left after that one, and so on and so on. Others believe, uh, as I was reading this, that the, the, the words here describe the different stages of one insect, the locust. But no matter which way you look at that, there was definitely some similarities between what the locust and the insects were doing, and it was a similarity and an illustration of what sin had already done on the inside. Okay? So we've talked about this many times on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Uh, God uses things in nature and in the world to illustrate to us something that's going on spiritually in our lives. Because everything speaks of Him. And so how does this affect us? Well, first of all, I want you to notice uh, the character of these insects, the character of the destruction, the different uh, waves that were coming in on the people that were causing uh, all this problem and all this calamity in the nation. Now, first of all, the word locust comes from a Hebrew word that means to multiply or a great multiple, multitude. Now, I want you to, uh, as I explain this, I want to try to illustrate or parallel what sin was doing in the life of these people. And I'm going to use this locust to do that, okay? And so this is what the Word of God does. It takes something that would have been familiar to these folks and applies it to their life to teach them a lesson. And I'm going to do that this morning with this. And this is what the locust means. It means to multiply or a multitude. Now let me explain to you the locusts, what the first stage would have been for these uh, insects. The locusts begin their attack, listen, by laying millions and billions of eggs in the soil. And those eggs can stay down there for days, for weeks, uh, for months, and even years, right down there in the soil. In other words, they stay down there in the root of the plant. In other words, they're down there in the foundation, in the soil, and they go unnoticed day after day after day until one day they hatch and then they're noticed. They begin to take their destruction from the soil and work up through the plant. Now, they can lay, as I said, millions and billions of these eggs in the soil. 
And what I'm trying to say to you this morning in a poor way, the best way I can, is isn't that how sin begins right down in the heart of an individual? In other words, long before I see your sin on the outside, something went wrong down in the foundation of things. In other words, down in the soul of your heart, something had been brewing maybe for days, maybe for weeks, maybe for years, but eventually it hatched and conceived and came out and brought forth sin on the outside. You see, sin always starts on the inside, doesn't it? And that is the most sinister tool of the devil is how he implants that into our hearts and our lives. Anybody can see a drug dealer on the outside. Listen, anybody can see a prostitute. Hey, anybody can see all these things that are going on on the outside. Uh, but what about all the things that are going on on the inside? Down in the foundation of things. Yes, sir. You see, Psalms 11, 3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Luke 6, 49, Jesus said, But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. See, it's a foundational thing. Here the sin attacks. Check this out. 1 Timothy 3.15 But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is in the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. You know how the world receives truth today? Through the church. That's right. It's the pillar. It's the ground. It's been in charge with the oracles of God to spread the gospel, the word of God, to a lost and dying world. In other words, if the foundations of the church have been moved, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And we can talk about what the world is doing out there this morning. And I can get you all fired up and get a lot of amens. But the bottom line is that the locusts started down deep in the soul where nobody could see. Yeah, that's right. You say, I can see all the outward stuff. But how much resentment did I bring into the house of God this morning? How much bitterness did I bring in this morning? Isn't that a, isn't that a terrible scene that will eat away at you? Pride. How much pride did I bring? How much sloth did I bring? How much covetousness did I bring in the house of God? Not the outward stuff, but the invisible stuff that we think no one can see. And yet God can see. And yet all along it's doing a work in your life right this morning. It's gnawing and eating away at you this morning. And we're bringing that stuff into the house of God. And we like to point out what's on the outside and what the world's doing. But God said, why don't we just look in the mirror and see what's going on this morning. Yes, sir. What I know about. And what you know about. Well, I want to tell you, the world, your neighbors, this nation that are around us are watching us and how we live our lives. Right. Don't blame them because the foundations have been destroyed. That's right. right. Marriage. I say that's a foundational thing. Yes, sir. And now we want to marry two men. And we just sit back and say, well, we can't do nothing about that. That's just the way the world is. Yeah. The family. That sounds like the foundational things to me. What kind of, what kind of, listen, you know who knows me, who I really am? <coughs> Outside of God, my family. <laughs> Don't you say nothing, James. <laughs> oh, they know. They know. Is there a difference between Pastor Brad in the pulpit and at home? See the things nobody can see, the foundational things. Your family look at you, listen, are you faithful to church? Your little grandbabies and grandkids, what are they seeing, Grandma and Grandpa? Huh. What about mom and dad? They see that? <clears throat> Man, we'll kill ourselves to give our children an education. I know I, that's what I want for my kids. It's for no expense. 
College, the work, it's good. Nicest things we can give them. I want to give them better than what I've had. There's nothing wrong with that. But listen, what I'm more worried about what my kids is wearing than how they worship God, I got a problem. Amen. When I'm more concerned about their uh, Facebook status than them seeking the face of God, I've got a problem. Yeah. Something's out of order. Listen, don't expect your kids to be faithful if you're not faithful. Amen. And don't expect that you'll stand before the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings one day and give an account for what you did in front of your children. That's right. yes, sir. And your daddies will be double. Because you're the head of the house. That's your responsibility. The foundations of the marriage, of the family, of the church, and we wonder why our young kids don't even know if they're a boy or a girl. Because the foundations are being moved. The foundations are being pushed over. What, what was God's word and standard and His truth has been pushed aside for whatever the world wants. Uh, tell me this, how come 75% I looked on every every year, I just glanced at these, uh, these polls or whatever, and 75% of the United States affiliates themselves with Christianity. 75%. And yet, we elect 95% of the most ungodly men and women we could to go up to Washington for. Yep. And the world and the nation around us are asking the question that they asked in Joel 2.17 where the Bible tells us that let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. Give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Mark this. Joel 2.17 Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Yeah. Where's your God this morning? Where's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Where's Jesus Christ this morning in your life, in the church? Now, why do they look at us and say, Where is your God? I tell you, where he is. He's right where we put him. <laughs> Listen, God is right where you want him in your life. You've got all of Jesus that you want right now this morning. If you haven't got enough of Jesus, it's because you don't want enough of Jesus. If He's not in your home, it's because you put Him out of your home. And you put Him out of your life. He's not one, He's not two, He's not three. He's not on your top ten. And you wonder, and you, we, we wonder why the people look at us and say, where is our God? We want God, we want to pray for our schools, and yet we put Him out of our schools. Yeah. Sure. You see, it's the foundational stuff. It's the hidden stuff. Now notice the palm worm as we move on. The palm worm, the name palm worm in Hebrew means to cut off or to cut. In other words, uh, when the palm worm, when it's hatched out, it begins to attack the stems and the leaves of its victims. In other words, it begins to attack the, bra <laughs> the branches. The branches. And in other words, all the leaves, all the life, all the things that could produce fruit that were possible uh, to have a bud there and a flower and a bloom and fruit, you need all that, all that green stuff, all that young life uh, that could do so much production, so much fruit. It just goes up there and just cuts it all the way. That's what sin will do for your life. Get saved. Get in a Bible preaching, Bible believing church. And start growing in the Lord and start putting on some leaves. And listen, you're right at the moment where you might go bear some fruit and you're starting to bud out. And here comes the palm worm to cut that down. That's what he wants to do. You see, he's looking to stop any kind of growth in your life. Amen. And he's not going to wait until you do something. He's going to start early. And he's going to start cutting away. And that's the third thing, the canker worm. It gets its name, 
from the Hebrew word that means to gnaw or to lick. The canker worm does this. It makes sure that after the palmer worm has cut down the green leaves and all the buds and everything that might give life, and it starts growing back a little bit, because if you cut it down, it'll grow back. And here comes that canker worm and just starts gnawing away. Is there anything worse than something gnawing on you? You ever had anything gnawing on you tonight? Yes, Lay in bed, something that starts gnawing on your old heart. That's what he's saying. It just keeps gnawing. Doesn't it? You think you've gotten one up on the devil and you're, you're man, you're, you're just doing, oh, you had such a good day, you're witnessing, you're passing out tracks, and it's been the best day you've had in weeks. And you even, man, I tell you, and all of a sudden you're coming home and somebody cuts you off on the freeway. Man, that gnaws at me. Does that gnaw at you? What well, gnaws at me? Start licking away. Start gnawing. Day after day after day. You know, many people are devastated by sin in their lives. They get the leaves cut off. They get the buds cut off. The branches get cut off. And they can't never recover. They just let that canker worm come and just gnaw at them and can Then there's a caterpillar. The name of the caterpillar means stripper or someone that strips. In other words, one that takes the bark of whatever's left on that tree or that vine and strips it all off. Joel 1.7 said, He had laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He had made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. See, that's the last and final phase. Took away all the armor of the tree. That's what the bark is. It's the armor of the tree. And once it takes away the armor and lays bare, what's underneath there? There's no stopping. The next thing is death. You know, the wages of sin is death. Listen, something that starts out in the soul of your heart, in that fertile ground that seems like it's ready to produce, ready to produce a tree that might produce fruit, long before, listen, you even know it, there's something down in there working in your life, working against you, and it's sin. Sin will take a toll in your life. You let a little bit of sin grab a hold of you. You start watching the wrong things on the computer. You start missing church. You start missing Sunday school. You start doing these things. Stop reading your Bible. And start praying. And listen, uh, that thing will take root down in there. That thing will go down into the soil and to the roots, and one day that thing's going to hatch out. You just keep playing. You just keep dabbling. You keep letting resentment in your heart, pride in your heart. Uh, you keep letting all that stuff uh, fester up in your heart. If you don't go to God and get that stuff cleaned out, it'll come out one day. That's right. I believe there's going to be times in our life we're going to find ourselves laid open. Our tree's going to be barked. And we're not going to have the armor of God because we haven't prayed and God knows when. <clears throat> Read our Bible and we've let that sin hatch and we've become lazy. And our concern is no more for the house of God and for the things of God. And all of a sudden, tragedy strikes. And all of a sudden, sin gets the upper hand. And we're just laid bare. Jeremiah, another prophet there in Jeremiah 5, 25, said, Your iniquities have turned away the things, and these things, the good things, and your sins have withholding good things from you. But then God told Joel to go tell the people <laughs> it's not too late. In other words, he said, why don't you go and blow the trumpet and sound the alarm? I'm glad for the warnings in life, aren't you? Amen. Yeah, I'm glad those signs there on the road. Like when we go up to West Virginia, if you've ever been up there on some of those back roads, Henry, yes. the road just, it just fall off of mine. And they don't fix it. What they do is they just put a sign up. And says, stop. That way you know not to go across there. And it's like it'll be there one year, and then it'll be there when you go back the next year. They ain't done nothing to that road. What is that warning sign wasn't there? You know that warning sign tells me that I still got a little time left before I die. 
I got a little time left. Uh, thank God somebody put up a warning sign. I got a little time left to, to restore, to get things right. Listen, I got a little time left before I go off the cliff. Mm -hmm. There's no help for me. I got a little time. I'm glad for the warnings in life. And I'm glad that God gives them a warning here. He says, blow the trumpet. Wake these people up. Well, we need to be woke up. I'm going to close here with a few points. I want you to take this and listen to me. God said in chapter 2, verse 25 in the book of Joel, He said, I will restore to you the years that the locusts as he, I'm telling you, the older I get, the realize the more time that I've wasted, the more things that I've missed, the more opportunities I look back that I had a chance to make a difference in somebody's life with the Word of God and pass them up. And you know what happens when you pass up something? Time just don't stop for you. It just keeps pushing on. And all of a sudden, you're 50. And then all of a sudden, you're 60. And you've got kids. They're gone. Grandkids. They're getting old. They're gone. Your sphere of influence is only just a short period of time. Yeah. You live to be a hundred. You just live in a little time. And we waste so much time. And God, in His great promises to us, said, I can restore the years. But He said, Here's what you got to do. He said, first of all, you got to be serious. Notice what verse 12 says in chapter 2 of Joel. It says, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn you even to me with all your heart and with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Are you urgent this morning? Are you just like, heard this before, I'm going to do what I want to do, and when I get through doing what I want to do, then I'll concentrate on God what you want me to do. In other words, God's calling for sacrifice and we're calling for convenience. Do you see how far difference it is from convenience to sacrifice? Yeah. In fact, we don't even like to go in the area of inconvenience. <laughs> Forget about sacrifice! Forget about revival! This we not even And we can't even get to the point of inconvenience. If it inconvenience me, I can't do that for God. You mean I gotta get up a little early and come to church? Don't you know I worked all week? And I need some me time? And then if that ain't bad enough, you blame it on your wife and kids and say, I need to spend some time with them. And if I went to your house, you're working on your speedboat. Isn't that what we do? That's right. I can talk myself in almost anything. <laughs> Be quiet. <laughs> I can make excuses. Where's the urgency? Where's the urgency? Now is the day of salvation. Knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of our sleep That's right. mm -hmm. before it's too late. Yes, sir. Are you serious? Are you hurt? You got to be serious if you want God to restore the years. You got to be hurt. You got to be sincere. Yes. Amen. Whoa, watch out. You got to be real. You gotta stop playing these games. Joel two thirteen said, "And rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord." Oh how well how we, yeah he said you know what he's saying he said you need to come and bring true repentance to the altar. You know what there's two kind of repentance in the Bible. There's true repentance, and then there's a false repentance. Yeah. Isn't that right? There's a true repentance, but then there's a false repentance. See, false repentance, 2 Corinthians 7 says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Yeah. 
You see, there's sorrow to repentance, and then there's sorrow I got caught. <laughs> sorrow I'm in trouble. Let me come down and pull the fire extinguisher and see if God will get me out of trouble, and then I'm going to go back and do what I'm doing. That's not true repentance. That's right. Let me give you an example of this so you'll leave here knowing what I'm talking about when I say you need to be real. Hebrews 12, 17, speaking of Esau, you know Esau, Jacob's brother, worldly man, sold his birthright. For you know how that afterwards, when he, that is Esau, would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance. Boy, that's a, that may be the scariest verse. I've preached like that. In other words, he found no place for repentance. Why? Because he wasn't real. That's what it says after that. Though he sought it carefully with tears. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry I ain't got all that money. Papa was going to leave me. I'm sorry I ain't got all that blessing I was going to get. I sold it because I didn't think nothing about God. And now I'm crying, God help me. Please forget your tears ain't repentance. You may cry. It may be a terrible experience. It should be. Your feelings ought to be hurt while you've done God, while you've hurt His feelings. You ought to cry, but I'm going to tell you, tears is not repentance if it doesn't come with faith. Amen. Amen. They're the same, different side of the same coin, you see. That's false repentance. Think about, listen, I'll tell you another false repentance. Think about, think about Pharaoh. Remember how all the frogs and all the pestilence come on his land? And Moses would come back to him and he'd say, Get out of here. I've changed my mind. Boy, you just got to go. God was right. I was wrong. Go ahead. And then about a day, he changed his mind. But he said, No, nah, I can't lose that. Go on out there and attack him. Bring him back here. Yeah. So he changed his mind, but he wasn't really sincere about it. Let me show you what sincere repentance is. The prodigal son was real repentance. You know that story? Yes, and when he came to himself, he was down there at the hog trough. Said, I'd be glad to eat these old husk and this old slop. Y'all know what slop is? Y'all know what slop is. <laughs> I had a slop bucket. Remember the slop bucket there behind your door, Mom? <laughs> slop bucket. And I give slop hogs. Anybody even know what that is? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He got down there and he said, I'm going to go out. Listen, in all my days, it's hunger. I've never been hungry, really. Well, I ain't never thought about getting on my knees and eating out of a hog trough. The slop that we put out there on it. But this man did. He was rich. His father was a prince. He was a prince. His father was rich. He came to himself. He was out of his mind. And he said this when he was down there at the hog trough in the hog pen. How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise. There's action there with I'll go to my father and I'll tell him this. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. You just make me a hired servant and I'll be happy. Well, that's true repentance. You remember when the Pharisee and the publican, I know I'm running along, but you remember when the Pharisee and the publican, they come to the altar and the Pharisee said, Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like him. <laughs> So you like to judge yourself on somebody else, don't you? If I'm a little better than him, I must be okay. But, see, he's not a measuring stick. Jesus Christ is a measuring stick. How about that? <laughs> you judge yourself on me. Uh, it ain't hard to get better than me. Judge yourself on Christ. But you know what the old publican done? He didn't say that. He wasn't so much as lift his head and even look to heaven. And he beat on his chest. He said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm guilty. And I repent of my sins and turn towards you. You're going to have to get sincere and stop playing these games. We've got to stop playing games with God. No, we're going to have to be sincere, but we're going to have to be separated. He said there in verse 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation. Assemble them together. In other words, you need to get out from whatever it is Put the distance between you and God. Sanctification. Separation. Whatever's got control of me, I've got to put it down. That's true repentance. That's faith in Him. Come out from among them. 
We've got simple influence, don't we? What are we doing that the world is doing? Well, that's what we, we're doing too much of what the world is doing. That's right. That's right. That's had influence on our church and all our lives. And then lastly, you're going to have to make supplication. Let the priest, in verse 17, the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare the people. God, we need mercy this morning. You know what I need more than anything? This morning I need mercy. I need His grace. I'm not saved because I don't miss church. I'm not saved because I'm a preacher. I'm not saved because I've led somebody else to the Lord. I'm not saved anything that I've done. I'm just saved by grace. That's right. Amen. And because of that grace, I feel like I, I need to do something for them. I feel like I need to bear some fruit for Him. I feel like I need to love Him more than anyone else. I feel like I just owe Him something. Not that I'm earning salvation, but for what He's done for me. Amen. I feel like I need to present myself a living sacrifice, which is my reasonable service. Holy and acceptable unto God. That's what I feel like. I feel like I need to come to Him in prayer and say, God, I'm sorry. I have taken Your grace and trampled it underfoot. God, I'm sorry. How I've lived for You. I'm sorry, God, for the things I've done. And then he says this in conclusion. He says, if you'll do that, verse 27 says, I'll be in your midst. <laughs> you know what's wrong with our churches today? He's not in our midst. <coughs> our altars are not full. Our eyes are dry. Our hearts are not rent. Just our garments. I've done made up my mind right now that I won't be back tonight. In fact, I made my mind up last night that just how much I was going to give God this week. I wouldn't hurt your feelings for nothing. I just feel like I needed to preach this to myself more than I needed to preach it to y'all. God, I'm sorry. But I'm not more like you after all the years that I've walked with you. Folks, we need to blow the trumpet this morning. Right. And sound the alarm. <clears throat> and get real right. about this thing. That's right. I wonder, Andy, if you come up, I don't know what we're singing. What we got there, well. <clears throat> 581, you please stand. 581, we're going to sing a few verses. Maybe you just want to come and say, you know what? God, I'm sorry. I've put a few things before you. I've got this thing a little out of whack. But I want to put you back up on the top shelf. All along, all by yourself. I want to be a better witness for my grandkids. I want to be a better father, better husband. I want to be a better church member. I just want more of you, Jesus, in my life. And I come to you and repent. Not with my garments, but with my heart in a real way, in a meaningful way. And say, God, I'm sorry. We need you, God. And God said, if somebody get real in the house of God, that he'd be in our midst right now. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what sin has stolen from you. Maybe your work, maybe your finances, maybe your family, whatever that is.
wasted? How much time have I wasted? Being more about praying than about Jesus. So I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what God's dealing with you right now. Maybe you've gone long enough and you say, I'm ready to restore the years. I'm ready to get real with God. I'm ready to be what God would have me be. And I need to just tell God, I'm sorry. God help. God help. Anyone at all. Maybe you're lost in here this morning. You say, you know what? I've never truly repented. I've never said that, God, you're right. I'm wrong. And by faith, I'm trusting in your blood that you died for me hung on the cross and you put in an empty tomb and three days later you rose from the grave that I might have everlasting life. Maybe you need that this morning. Maybe you're not sure about that thing. Why don't you come and get that thing sure this morning? You want it all before we close. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're so good to us. Lord, after all we've done, Lord, you just open your arms and say, return unto me. And I'll show you mercy and grace. And I'll be in your midst. And I'll bring the former rain and the latter rain. I'll make the crops to grow. I'll make you to bear fruit. And God, we just thank you for that precious promise, Lord Father, that you sounded a warning because it's not too late. So God, thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for your warnings, Lord God. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, I want you to go through your neighborhoods, uh, pile up as many kids as you can. Some of you got trucks, just throw them in the back. <laughs> King cabs, just ride back through here, through uh, back here and over there, wherever we're at. I don't know where we're at this morning, but just go to your neighborhood, bring as many kids as you can. Brother Dean and uh, Brother Robert will be here. Uh, Preaching to all of us, I mean, it's a great, I love it. I love to watch them do that. But it really, I have to say, it really strikes home for these young folks and uh, teenagers and, and just to see them put on the gospel in that way with those science projects and stuff. Uh, if you've got some young ones, grandkids, nephews, nieces, cousins, please bring them tonight. Fill this place up and let's see some folks get saved and, and a foundation built on something like a rock will last. Everything else is just sinking sand. That's right. Just sinking sand. That's all it is. So anyway, I'm going to ask Brother Andrew from Butler if he close us in a word of prayer. Lord, just thanks for us. Come out today, Lord. Just learn more about you, Lord. Just to worship and look at your name, Father. Lord, just pray now that as we go back to our homes, Lord, and just bring us back tonight, Lord. Just ready to hear your word again, Lord, Father. We just thanks for the doctor and Brad brought forth to us today, Lord. Just Thanks for blessing him with him and his family, Lord, and just let us just continue to touch and watch over and take care of him, Lord. Just forgive us of our sins, Father, and we just love you and thank you. Let's never pray. Amen. Amen.